Hello friends, who's been leaving all these amazing comments on my channel this past month? I think it's you. Let's jump right in and have a look at a few of them. So, I did a video on whether you could ever upload your mind into a computer, and there were some great comments. Uh, I think a lot, of, a lot of my responses are just gonna come down to me going, well, I uh, never knew that, thanks very much. Because as I said in that video, computer science is not my field, but I was very happy to learn. And very grateful that all the people pointing out the, the things that like I didn't understand about computer science pointed it out in a really nice, constructive way, so thank you. I worried when I uploaded that episode that there'd just be a whole lot of people being like, oh, you don't know anything. A few people opined that uh, although neurons in the brain are not like a binary, they mediate chemically, which is kind of more of a spectrum, uh, you can in fact express that in binary. You can like program spectra? Spe spectra, yeah. You can program spectra into binary. It just takes a lot more work than just having two states. And yeah, that's fair enough. Now that you say that, I'm like, oh yeah, duh. Uh, but yeah, it didn't occur to me beforehand and I'm curious about that now. Similarly, RPG Grenade said that we could program an understanding of time and energy into a computer. Kristen Thorson was the researcher who I quoted in that video saying, that uh, that's kind of a challenge at the moment. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you might well be right. Um, I think if I were to do that video again, I would present the challenges as, as more challenges. I think I, the way I, I expressed them, I was like, this is, this, is like, this is what makes it impossible. But uh, I think if I said it was impossible, then history would probably end up laughing at me. So <laughs> I think if I were to do it again, I would say these are the challenges that could be overcome. And you've come up with some, some potentially brilliant approaches there. I didn't want to say solutions because I did a video a while ago on the difference between solutions and approaches to problems, so. Jagland said that computers do kind of distort things when they record them, like some files end up compressed and that's a kind of distortion. So if you remember I was talking about the difference between a computer recording something and human memory, and I, although I, like, I understand and I, I agree that there's some distortion there, I'm not quite sure that's the same as the kind of selection and revisiting and romanticizing that goes on when, uh, when humans remember things. I'm, I'm, I'm very wary of just going, it's not the same, dogmatically. I guess, maybe, if survival is what's important rather than identity, which is what we talked about towards the end of that video, then maybe if we could upload a mind into a computer, it would remember things differently and it would have a very different memory. Maybe it wouldn't be capable of the kind of uh, romanticism and uh, kind of going back and changing things and misremembering things the way that a human can. But maybe that wouldn't matter. Maybe it would still be uh, some continuation of that person. Maybe they would in some sense survive. Reptiles Pantozo said that the whole premise of our discussion was wrong because nobody had ever proven that consciousness does reside in the brain. Uh, fair enough. Uh, I at least didn't prove that in the video. Uh, although we could substitute the word brain for like any body part, whatever, wherever you think it resides, if you think it resides in the in the toes or in the liver or in the pineal gland, wherever you, wherever you like it, we could substitute that and have pretty much the same debate. Um, unless, of course, you don't think that it does in fact reside in the body at all, in which case, uh, fair enough, I think I would have some other questions as well. Daddy Leon pointed out something which didn't even occur to me, that what if the upload of your mind into a computer was just like a copy? It wasn't, because I, when I upload this video to YouTube, I don't sort of transfer the whole thing, it, I upload a copy version of it. So, I mean, how gutted would you be if you pay for the procedure to be uploaded into your shiny new robot body, and then you're stuck in, in your other body, and then meanwhile the robot's walking around going, yeah, it worked, the procedure worked, I'm here. Absolute nightmare. Speaking of science and fiction, I also did a video on flat, Earth and why some people reject scientific claims, what that can tell us about the philosophy of science. Quite a few people turned up in my comment section to argue that the Earth is flat, which, um, sorry, it isn't. The video wasn't really 100% about that anyway, that was just kind of an introduction to the topic, so whatever. Robert Bilergion said that they are convinced that the planet is round almost not as much by the evidence but by how massive the conspiracy would have to be to hide it. And yeah, I think that's a fair point. That's kind of tying into conditions of persuasion like we talked about in the video. It made me wonder like, what's the biggest conspiracy that's, that, that there's ever been? What's the biggest truth that's ever been hidden from the biggest number of people? Surely it can't even like come close to how massive it would have to be to hide the fact that the earth was flat. We talked about the idea that citations in scientific academic papers 
are kind of like appeals to authority if the scientist hasn't explicitly repeated those experiments themselves. They're kind of like saying you can trust these results, which is more of an act of persuasion. And a few people took umbrage with this. A few people were like, no, it's not. It's like providing a, a reference, a breadcrumb trail for you to follow and you want to know where they got that idea from. You can, you can if you want to, track it down. You can do like H-bomb does, where he just sort of follows the, the breadcrumb trail of the sources and finds out where ideas come from. And yeah, I see your point. I think it can be both though. I think it can be both a breadcrumb trail and an act of persuasion. Stephen Lamb, who was very, very kind, asked me about that promise I made to myself not to use the channel to say anything bad about anyone. And when I started out five years ago, I made a promise to myself, uh, wow, oh, five years ago. Wow, uh, 31st of May, uh, 2018, it'll be, it'll be five years of Philosophy Tube. Wow, that's like half a decade, it's a long time. Um, my entire 20s. Anyway, when I started I made a promise to myself that I wouldn't use the channel to make anybody specific feel bad about themselves or try and avoid putting anyone down with it. And he asked me why I did that. Um, I think at the time when I was setting it up and doing my research and figuring out how I wanted to make the show, uh, I, I got the impression, I, I watched a lot of YouTube videos to find out, okay, okay what kind of styles can I, can I kind of pick from? Uh, or what can I be inspired by and learn from? I felt that a lot of people on YouTube were kind of putting people down. I was like, okay, it's kind of been done before. Um, and I felt that that people who did that a lot didn't re weren't really sort of viewed positively in the community by sort of other YouTubers massively, or, or if they were, it was tended to be by the YouTubers who did the same thing. I was quite inspired by PBS Idea Channel, uh, as some of you may know, and they never said anything, they never had a bad word to say about anybody specific by anybody who was alive and could potentially feel attacked or hurt. They, they, I don't remember them ever sort of saying, like, Gary, who lives in like number five, screw Gary, you know? They would occasionally be like, this theory by these people is kind of bunk, and anybody who believes in it is kind of like, well, you know, you kind of, you've had the wool pull over your eyes or whatever. Um, and I do that sometimes too. But I, th I think I've, uh, I think I've stuck to my promise um, overwhelmingly. I, I hope I have. Another dimension of it, I guess, would be that I had uh, older brothers growing up, and, and I still do. And uh, I, I knew what it was like to be kind of picked on and teased as a kid. So I just never really, never really went in for that sort of thing. I got an anonymous question on Curious Cat from this person who wanted to know how important it is to know the names of the theories, like direct realism, indirect realism, idealism. How important is it to be able to refer to them by name? Well, if you know the names, it can help you search for them and look them up, which if you want to know more is kind of helpful. And if you're studying philosophy as a student, particularly at A-level, uh, they will refer to the theories by name on the exams. They'll be like, talk about the problems with direct realism, or like, compare and contrast indirect realism with Barker's idealism, does one lead to the other, like 40 bucks. So it can be helpful to know the names for that reason, but if you're not studying philosophy formally and it's just something you can't have a passing interest in, they don't feel you have to know the names by any means. Music Cassette asked whether mathematics is a kind of, uh, is a mathematical demonstration an act of persuasion? And I, I guess so, although I see where you're coming from. I see why you might question that. Because they are more a priori, as philosophers like to say. They're less about, here's the evidence, and more about, here's what the concept means. Although I guess by doing a mathematical demonstration, you are still implicitly saying that it's worth doing. That this is sort of useful, or helpful, or interesting, or beautiful, or whatever it is. So there's still some kind of act of persuasion going on there. But great question. And lastly, Firdos Ahmed asked whether I can do a video on Hegel. Yes, I can. It comes out next week. I've been working on it for a long time. It's about half an hour long. Uh, it's gonna be a lot of fun. It's got cameos from four other YouTubers in it. Uh, the Hegel video is, is kind of the biggest thing I've made in a while. It's gonna be pretty spectacular. I hope you enjoy it. I hope I've got all the Hegel right, because I know that Gregory Sadler's going to be watching it, who is, when it comes to Hegel videos on YouTube, he's the man. I'll put a link to his work in the description so you can check him out. His work has really greatly helped me uh, write the script for this and helped me understand Hegel. But uh, yeah, Hegel, it's coming next week. Thank you for all of your fantastic comments this month. An extra special thank you to all my patrons on Patreon. And without further ado, I will leave you with the credits. Patreon.com slash PhilosophyTube is what allows me to make the show. Thank you so much to all of the people who helped me so generously. If you can't sign up for a regular pledge, you can also make a one-time donation 
at paypal.me slash philosophytube.